Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to my channel and today a little episode of Ham Bites. This is where we take a look at uh, things that Ken Ham, the CEO and founder of Answers in Genesis, has had to say in recent days. In fact, this morning. Um, this is his most recent tweet and I thought it'd be informative to read through it because I've talked about uh, this very topic that he mentions here, which is the status of poodles. Yeah, poodles. I mean, he often incorporates talking about poodles into many of his talks. And so here he's trying to, uh, I guess, um, fix some misconceptions people have about his opinion about poodles. But in the process of doing so, he's going to talk about speciation, kinds, what are dogs, uh, how that relates to the biblical model, in his mind, the biblical model of the origin of species. And so in a way, what he has just penned this morning, which I actually believe he actually did pen this as opposed to the blog posts that are on Answers in Genesis, which are done by a team of help. Um, I think these are his thoughts and this is the way he thinks. So I think it's informative to look at this sort of like trying to, he's trying to wrap up into a neat little bow, his view of biological diversity. Okay, let's Let's just get started. Let's let Ken Ham uh, lead this uh, for us. Despite what I've been saying, please don't think I hate dogs like poodles <laughs> or Bichon Fries, even though they are degenerate mutants. Okay? They're degenerate mutants. So why does he think that they're degenerate mutants? That's, that's really the theme here of this particular tweet. A lot of staff at Answers in Genesis have such degenerate mutants. My friend Ray Comfort of Living Waters loves his little degenerate mutant, despite the fact it's only a shadow of what the dog kind was when God created the original dogs. So what are the original dogs? And how is a poodle simply a shadow of the original state of the created kind of dogs? Hmm. And what does he mean by dogs? Spoiler alert, it's not just domesticated dogs, but dogs is his general term for canines, right? The family community, which includes foxes and wolves and coyotes, right? And African wild dogs and Maine dogs and crab eating dogs, all right? And so forth, right? There's like 36, 37 different living species of canines today. Hey, even Ken Ham, he once had a dog, Sean Fries. She may have looked cute, but the science of genetics confirmed what I always said about her. She's a degenerate mutant affected by sin and the curse. Remember, this is a essential theme of young earth creationist and the world, young earth creationist worldview is that the sin of Adam and Eve and the curse placed on, in his mind, creation because of Adam's sin has affected every bit of the workings of the natural world or God's providential world. And therefore, is everything that we have today is some, simply but a shadow of what it once was. All right, so he likes to call dogs degenerate mutants. In fact, really, if you apply his logic, all living things on the face of the earth are degenerate mutants, including us, right? None of the things that you see today are very good. They are degenerate mutants. Of course, I was a bit worried I would personally have what we would call in Australia a dog's life. Once my wife heard what I called her dog, but I can still use such little dogs to help people understand science and the Bible. This is why he uses them in his talks. All right? He often refers to poodles and when he tells them stories. Then surely our dog could become a hero. All right? he, can be, he can be redeemed. Right? He's, he's a degenerate mutant, but if we can use God's degenerate mutant, for good, all right, for, for us helping us understand science, then hey, that's actually a heroine. It's something we can be, we can celebrate these uh, poodles. So he's trying, he's trying to resurrect the poodle from the state of being a, an utter degenerate, which is what he often talks about in his talks. It's like, he, I'm going to show you a picture in just a moment of the poodle being the, the sort of the end result of this trail of, of tragic mutations from the fall all the way down to the poodle. And the poodle represents the most degenerate of all the domesticated dogs. Now, he's saying that kind of half-heartedly. I know, he's, he's not necessarily saying like, the poodle's the absolute worst. But he is giving that impression that domesticated dogs are like almost worse off and least like God's original creation than all the other canines. All right, so here's, here's one such image 
that is from the Answers in Genesis website. They did a recent series of posts in which they talked about de-evolution, about these the dangers of young earth evolutionists within the young earth creationist myths. And in doing so, one of those articles was called De-Evolution, and they were talking about how uh, that, that uh, evolution requires uh, increases in information and increase, increases in complexity, and yet the world is a place in which is, everything is declining and descending into, uh, well, it's genetic entropy. Everything's falling apart. And how do they present that as an image? This is a very common image at young earth creationist speaking events, right? You have this wolf, got a coyote, got a, what is that? African wild dog. Then you got a collie there, a bulldog and a poodle. And you see that little line there saying like you start, you have the dog kind. These are all members of the dog kind, but the dog kind starts with something that's like larger and apparently more complex. All right. has a better genome. And then in that, that wolf has lost information and eventually you end up with a poodle, which has the least amount of information. And it's the most, has the most corrupted genome. This figure makes absolutely no sense to me, um, genetically, um, biologically, anything like that, because uh, we have no, I don't know anyone who thinks that wolves, you know, the coyotes are somehow less complex than wolves, and then somehow African wild dogs are have less information than coyotes. Like, what data, what evidence do you have that an African wild dog is less complex or has less information? First, you have to provide a definition for information, which I've never heard come straight from a young earth creationist mouth in, in, in any sense that, that we could actually use it to actually test hypotheses. But and then somehow African wild dogs, less information is than domesticated dogs. But in this article or in this tweet, we're going to see that Ken Ham acknowledges that all domesticated dogs are actually just part of the gene pool of wolves, right? They don't come from African wild dogs. So I don't know who the graphic artist that works with Answers in Genesis that puts together these, these images um, that are used uh, for their, their articles and in their seminars. Um, but they don't seem to like you know, make it cohesive or, you know, uh, it's not a coherent message that's being sent from Answers in Genesis from what they say versus what they're, what they're imaging here. I'll leave that up and let's keep reading on. A report I read stated, all right, hey, Ken Ham has read some kind of a report of dog genetics, right? And so he's going to use those dog genetic, uh, that dog genetic research to support his hypothesis uh, that uh, dogs are just run-down mutants, right? They're degenerate mutants. From the towering Great Jane to the feisty little Chihuahua, all dogs are brothers under the skin. Now researchers have uncovered a reason why the animals wearing the skin, wear, <coughs> excuse me, wearing that skin varies so much in size. Larks, Portuguese water dog, love water dogs. I know a couple of people that have water dogs. Uh, Georgie had died and was seeking a new one. Hearing that he was a geneticist, the dog, the breeder urged him to work on dog genes. So he began the Georgie project, uh, studying the genes of Portuguese water dogs, a breed that comes from a wide range of sizes from 25 pounds to 75 pounds. Yeah, Portuguese water dogs range quite a bit in size. I've got an old English sheepdog like sitting like directly below me. She'll be asleep the whole time, so I probably won't see her. But you might see my other dog wander by once in a while. Um, and sheepdogs also come in just some fairly wide range of sizes. Mine's, uh, mine's up to about 90 pounds now, um, but they can be quite a bit heavier there, and they can also be a fair bit smaller than that. So there's, there's some variation there, and it's not just environmental variation, meaning, hey, you fed yours more than I fed mine. No, uh, they have, it's genetic variation leading to different uh, total masses, right? Body size, body frame, basically, development. The report continued. Ostrander and colleagues then extended that to a range of large and small breeds, and the researchers looked at located a section of DNA that varied between large and small breeds in many cases. Known as the regulatory sequence, the difference in the, on dog chromosome number 15 next to a previously known gene named IGF-1 for insulin-like growth factor 1, the hormone controlled by the IGF-1 gene helps mammals, including us, all right, grow from birth to adolescence. It's a really, really important. Um, uh, gene product that we produce. 
In small dog breeds, a mutation in the sequence next to the gene kept them from growing larger, the researchers said. It's not actually in that gene. It's actually in a regulatory sequence uh, that's next to this gene, all right, for IGF-1. All right, and so some change there, some genetic change there caused uh, the amount that probably changed the regulation of IGF-1, which then changes the amount or expression of that product, which then, depending on how long that and how much is expressed during different stages of development, will lead to a different amount of growth of the particular individual. Um, so they're suggesting that, like, yeah, we found, we found a particular variant that results in having a smaller version of this dog versus a larger version of this dog. And across Portuguese water dogs, actually across many other different breeds as well, typically dogs that are smaller have this particular allele, this particular variant uh, in their genome. So this scientist discovered a mutation that caused certain dog breeds to remain small in size. Okay, now I would probably agree that it's a mutation. It's probably not the, probably this particular variation uh, in the genome is probably not found in wolves, which is the ancestral genome for all domesticated dogs. And since that would be the frame of reference, right? The frame of reference would be the dog is, the, or the, the wolf, sorry, is the original genome. And then later generations, you have domesticated dogs, of which some of them have this particular variant. We would look at that and we'd say, like, based on fancy name is polarizing, all right? I've polarized the information such that I can see that the original state was, doesn't have that variation, and now that variation exists. So I think it would be proper to call that a mutation, right? That's a, that's a new variant in the domesticated dog population. Right, so then my wife had no option but to admit that our dog was a mutant. Right, see, Ken Ham is right. He's a degenerate mutant, right? She was a de degenerate mutant. Um, doesn't have the original genotype of the original wolf. And in Ken Ham's mind, doesn't have the original genotype of the original canine, which wasn't a wolf, uh, but the original canine that, that God had created in, on the sixth day. Uh, and so therefore, since this is something different than the original one, it's less perfect, right? It's a, it's a degenerate. Um, all right, where was I? A mailman stopped by and my dog started barking, so. Um, scientists discovered mutation. Oh yeah, so my wife had no option to admit the dog was a mutant. Overall, 21 researchers studied 3,241 dogs from 143s, ranging from Bichon Fries, Chihuahuas, Maltese, Pomeranians, and so forth. Um, the article also stated, as many other secular articles have done, that dogs are descendants from wolves, having been domesticated 12,000 to 15,000 years ago. Notice he had, to put, he, had to, he had to put the notice in there that as secular articles have done, because he's now going to mention a date which is older than the age of the earth. Right? So dogs have been around since before the, before the origins of the earth, uh, 12,000 to 15,000 years ago. So obviously he doesn't believe that date. What does he believe? He believes that dogs originated some 6,000 years ago. But even more so, he believes that there was only two representatives of dogs on Noah's Ark. Um, and so I should be using the word canines now. Two representatives of canines on the Ark. So there wouldn't have been any domesticated dogs on Noah's Ark, right? There would have been two canines. Uh, and if you go to the Ark encounter, he's got, you know, you can see the two canines, a representation of those two canines. They're not domesticated dogs. They're some kind of amalgam of foxes, wolves, coyotes, and, you know, African wild dogs kind of like <laughs> squished together into like some kind of package that's supposed to represent like, hey, all the genetic variation to make all of these things is like right here in this package. So what's the, all, what's the point of all this? Well, as we've written many times before, all dogs are one kind. Even though there was great variation within dogs and many different species and varieties with certain species. Now, see, here's where he's mixing his terminology. So he's talking about dogs. So you might think he's talking about domesticated dogs being one kind. And he's saying there's a lot of variation among dogs or within dogs with many different species and varieties within certain species. You see, domesticated dogs are simply a variety, different varieties of wolves. And all this variation occurs within the dog kind. So all these different variants that make up domesticated dogs are all present in the original wolf kind. But then the wolf is also just a subset of the original kind because there's 36 other species of canines plus 
a hundred other extinct species of canines. So lots and lots of different species, each of which potentially had many subspecies, right? Some variations uh, of them. And all of those had to have come from just two dogs just 4,350 years ago, stepping off Noah's Ark. So in his, so for Ken Ham, he's explaining to his audience, there, this has nothing to do with molecules to man evolution, right? What, what we're talking about, you know, my, my dog having a mutation causing it to be smaller than another dog, that has nothing to do with how organisms like might change from one kind to another. It's simply variations in, on a theme, and the theme is the dog, the canine. On the contrary, the processes of natural selection and speciation result in redistribution of genetic information. Okay, I mean, natural selection doesn't create variation, it just sorts variation, all right? It selects based on environmental um, features, right? Environmental pressures it sorts and selects for certain features that work best in that particular environment. Uh, and so if there's a population of one species and you have some members living in one different, a bit different environment than other, you could, you could sort those different variants in different ways, right? Changing the allele frequencies in different populations, which result in somewhat different looking organisms, which eventually you might be able to call different species. Um, so it's not like horribly off right here. This has nothing to do with molecules to man. On the contrary, the process of natural selection speciation results in the redistribution of genetic information or loss of genetic information. Yes, that's true. Natural selection can lead to the loss of information. Uh, let's just say information would be uh, variants, genetic variants, right? Loss of genetic diversity. Or mutations that act on the information that is already there, as in the case of the poodles to corrupt information. Mm. See, he's trying to lay out a kind of a definition of information. See, he doesn't want to say that a mutation that creates a new feature, I mean, a smaller dog, a smaller version of a dog, is a new characteristic for that particular breed or for wolves, right? To create a very a mini version of a wolf via a change in its DNA. So, because what is it? It's a change in the DNA, which causes a change in the expression of a protein, which has a, a physical effect on the organism, right? It changes its phenotype, a characteristic. And so that change in the DNA changed the organism. And we can call that, mutate, that, that change a mutation. But Ken Ham is being very careful in his terminology here. He's saying, Mutations that act on information that's already there. <laughs> He's saying that the DNA already existed. Right? There was already a gene, like a regulatory gene or a regulatory sequence outside the gene. The sequence that governs how that gene is going to be turned on or how much it's going to be turned on. That sequence already existed. So he's calling that the information. Right? That's the information that's in the wolf. And then what you've done is you've made a change to that information, that previously existing set of DNA sequence. And then it changes what that sequence does and results in a different phenotype. But he doesn't want to call that new information. He's going to admit it's a new characteristic, right? He's going to say it's going to act on the information that's already present there, as in the case of the poodles, to corrupt information. So he's actually defining information, I guess, as the original ATCs and Gs. I, and saying, like, whatever the original sequence was, that's the, the information. And anything that changes that to something else is simply taking what is already there and corrupting the information. And so it's either losing the information, you lose, you lose a piece of DNA, or you lose a variant that was originally there. Or you change and create a new variant, except he's not going to like the word create new variant. That, that is what it is, though, right? I mean, you're, you're creating a new form of gene regulation. There's nothing inherently wrong with the, the gene regulating that sequence slightly differently, creating a smaller dog versus a larger dog. Is there something wrong with a small dog versus a larger dog? As far as I can tell, poodles are pretty successful in the environment. Right, the environment being living in our homes, <laughs> it's, like, it's like 
um, they went from not existing to, uh, or not existing as a, a, that certain gene pool package, right? And then that particular, those particular set of variants has been protected and saved over many, many generations. And now there's lots and lots and lots of poodles and they reproduce fairly success, quite successfully. Um, so it's not a bad mutation, right? It's not a loss of information. It's a change in what, how that particular piece of portion of the genomic information is read, all right? How it's expressed. Um, but Ken Ham doesn't want to say that this is something new. Uh, he'll admit that there's new traits, but those traits are simply corruptions of the original perfect traits. So God never intended, apparently, for a wolf to be able to have a small dog offspring. So that's why poodles really are corruptions of the original created kind. They are degenerate mutants. Right. And, and, and much more of a so in the case than maybe some other animals. Although, I mean, let's say, let's put it, let's put it, let's just say that all organisms, as I said before, every single organism is a corruption in the young earth creationist model. Because there is no organism alive on earth today that has the original information in his way of defining this, right? The information that was already there, right? The information that was already there would be like the created set of genome, this, the created genome. Every created genome no longer is what that originally was. Now, I've talked a lot about the nonsensical idea of the original created genome and, and how you'd have variation, how you could talk about perfection. There, there's lots and lots of things to discuss there. That's not what we're doing here. Right now, let's just continue on. There's no mechanism for brand new information, which never previously existed to be added into the gene pool for any kind. Okay, this is straight up a uh, lie. But I don't, you know, I don't know how to say it because um, I've done multiple videos showing how new information based on this definition, which is genetic, inf genetic DNA added to the gene pool. Right, that's what's implied here, right? Not adding new gene pool information. And many, many other people have shown that plenty of evolutionary literature that shows how new, in, new information in this sense is formed. Um, he either is utterly ignorant, which he shouldn't be, because he should have run across this and he should have been told this by somebody at his, uh, his, his ministry. How does he, so, um, and, and again, I've done a bunch of videos on that. I mean, I can link to a couple where I can give you specific examples, but let's just, let's just, let's just uh, summarize it as this. Um, if you're going to say that that changes like mutations are corrupting original information, what happens when you duplicate or copy something and then use it to make something else? Right? You can create a whole new trait, a whole new characteristic. You can have a new enzyme that's based on a copy of a of a previous enzyme. Here's how Ken Ham would get around that. I think this is what this is why he would say he's not lying. All right, that's all. I'm going to give him an out here. He's wrong. Um, because he's, he's using an, such an exclusive definition of meaning of information that it's, that it's meaningless. He's going to say that, oh, you had an original piece of DNA, and if some of it gets copied, then you're not adding information. You're simply changing the information that was there. And then so if you could add a piece and add a piece and add a piece, you could duplicate a piece of a chromosome, then you could make new genes. But those new genes are mutations of the original sequence, so therefore they're degenerate even if they're making something, even if they're making a new product. So you can actually, but the thing is you're adding complexity. You add complexity organs them because you can have one olfactory receptor gene get re replicated into 50 of them. Or like elephants, they have 10 copies of a gene for helping them to uh, re uh, prevent cancer, right? Whereas you only have one copy of the same gene. They have 10 copies of the gene. And their ancestors, potentially, as a kind, maybe had fewer copies, especially since they were smaller in the past, which is, <laughs> just, I got to dig a little tangent here. Ken Ham is always showing like organisms getting smaller as if they're losing information. Like somehow being small means you have less information, like your genome has to be smaller and you have less like complexity. I, that makes no sense. 
but he always like pictures like starting out as like perfection as being larger and then reduction in size. But you know, the, the elephant that was on Noah's Ark was small and then became these larger elephants we have today because there's been like a hundred different species of elephants. Um, and there's a bunch of other kinds of things on on the Ark Encounter where they show a small version, like a tiny, like like a giraffe, right? There weren't any giraffes on Noah's Ark. There was a smaller version of something with a short neck that then became larger, right? How is that? A, that was a loss of information? Because <laughs> it has to be, right? Because it, it had original perfect genome, and now it's been degrading, and it degraded into this larger, more magnificent organism. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So back to the this. Uh, there's no mechanism for brand new information. Wrong. Um, while we may see different characteristics, uh, while we might see different characteristics visible in different species like dogs, wolves, dingoes, coyotes, foxes, this is the result of new combinations of information from the original gene pool, not new information. This is confusing. This is because what he's saying is this is the result of new combinations of information from the original gene pool. What he's saying is like God created the original genome and it had tons of variation. You know, so I don't know how. Still trying to figure out how that is. Um, I mean, I guess he could have created thousands of original canines um, that weren't in different species, just all like one species, but lots of variation. And he's saying that by recombining all those, you get different like different ways the genes work together and different combinations, packages of alleles, and you get different expressions of different kinds of dogs. Great. But he's like trying to say that all the original variation was there in the original one. But he just gave an example of a variant in his own dog that didn't exist in the original creation. Right? That wasn't part of the original gene pool. He's admitting it's a mutation. He's admitting that that domesticated dog has a mutation in that gene that causes it to be smaller. Like floppy ears, that's also a mutation that doesn't exist. That's a, that's a mutation in a gene causing it to act differently than it did before. So obviously new variants arise, right? And he's not kind of not admitting that. He's kind of like trying to say there's all this variation and it gets sorted out. But then, he's gonna, then he gives examples of new variants that come into existence. And we could come up with thousands of those types of variants. Um, so he's saying that's not new information itself. And such species we, produ we produced after flood being descendants of two dogs that went on Noah's Ark and carried an enormous amount of genetic diversity in their DNA. So he's, got, he's like, no, we're going to pack in all the diversity of domesticated dogs into those two dogs that were on Noah's Ark. They're going to step off the Ark and then start to have a litter. They're, gonna, they're a male, female. They have a litter of 10 puppies. And those 10 puppies recombine all that variation. And each of those 10 puppies look really different from one another. One of them had like African wild dog looks. And another one had like a gray fox look. And another one had a red foxy sort of type of characteristics. And another one had a, you know, a coyote sort of a look. But of course, they had to mate with each other, all right, in order to create another, you know, and then they had to mate with each other. So the gene pool is being constantly mixed. And then they begin to migrate across the world. Uh, this is all nonsensical population genetics it all like oh it sounds fine like because what he's doing is he's comparing this domesticated dogs see in only fifteen thousand years really only four thousand years we went from a from taking a, a wolf and separating its in, a genes into different genomic packages called domesticated dogs and we have hundreds of breeds and if that could happen in a short period of time then why not all canines they're the same thing right it's like two wolves got off the ark and made a bunch of domesticated dogs. Why couldn't two canines get off the ark and make a bunch of different species? Why? Because that's a completely different level of change. Completely different level of change than making domesticated dogs from wolves. Ah, here we go. Now, I know this is good. You probably can't read this uh, on your device. Uh, I'll just tell you what's going on here. Uh, this is a phylogeny. Uh, a relationship tree of all the different types of canines, um, all the living canines, but then also a whole bunch of extinct things, although certainly not all the extinct uh, organisms. Uh, and so right down here, you have uh, canini, uh, which is a subtribe. So it's a subgroup. I, I, for, let's just start here. 
Ken Ham says this entire figure here, all the members up and down here, these are all different scientific names of different species. Not, there's no domesticated dogs on here. These are all different species of canines. And so Ken Ham would be looked to like down here as being like the common ancestor. That would be your pair of canines that got off Noah's Ark. And then they then divided and split into increasingly divergent groups of different species. Um, and those species continue to bifurcate into more species and more species and more species. Now, along the way, bunches of them went extinct. I, I told you, there's over a hundred different identified species of canines in the fossil record that do not, that, that aren't alive today. However, all those fossils are in the post-flood record, right? They are things that Ken Ham believes were fossilized after Noah's flood. Right? Ken Ham doesn't think or doesn't know of or can't point to any fossil of a canine right, that was killed during Noah's flood. Right, so two canines got off the ark. The rest of the canines were killed in the flood, although apparently we haven't found any yet. And then they started to populate the earth and they got preserved in post-flood sediments. Uh, and so many of those lineages went extinct. We have 36 species today. But lots more than that have gone extinct. So they've come into existence and they've gone extinct and they got preserved in the fossil record somehow in the space of less than 4,000 years. So what you have here is you have, these are all the foxes up here. These are the uh, South American dogs. So you have like the crab eating dog and you got the main dog. I mean, this is some pretty weird canines uh, in South America. And all those South American ones are kind of related are related by common ancestry. They, they're genomically, they're similar to one another than they are to everything else. So the idea there is that some, some kind of canine got to South America and then populated that area and those populations became different species. Um, and Ken Ham would say, well, yeah, that's fine. You know, they got off the Ark and then they migrated across the Bering Strait during the Ice Age and then they got to South America and then they became all these different species. And there's species of wolf-like things, the caninity, uh, in North America, and then you've got the foxes, which are also found all around the world. So foxes also migrated to all these different places. And there's actually a, one separate group of foxes called the gray foxes, which are very different than all other canines and completely incompatible with all the canines, by the way. So I don't know why they're considered part of the same kind uh, by young earth creationists. Uh, but here's the point. The reason I'm showing this is you don't have to see the names, you just see the pattern. Um, and the ages, this is like most of this speciation is occurring over 10 million years. Uh, but where did domesticated dogs lie? I can't remember because I can't see this myself. Uh, Canis lupus, which is wolves, is one of these in here. Uh, there's a bunch of extinct species of wolves, like dire wolves, uh, living out in California and other areas. Uh, we have thousands of representatives of those because of the La Brea tar pits. Uh, and so you have domesticated, sorry, not basic, you have wolves, and it's just one of these lines goes to wolves. Like, that's one lineage, that's one species, which is distinct genetically from other species of wolves, right? And then, so you have Canis latrans as well, that's the coyote, which is a type of wolf. All right, and so one of these lines leads to Canis lupus, the gray wolf. And if I were to put domesticated dogs on here, you wouldn't really be able to see it, because domesticated dogs arise, well, just in the last 10,000 years, and also genetically, they're so similar to gray wolves that they would all just show up as little tiny, tiny branches that would be invisible on this particular figure because they'd all be so similar to gray wolves. Now what Ken Ham is doing is, and this is what many young earth creationists do, is they love to talk about domesticated dogs and they're like show how you could get so many variants, so many different types of uh, breeds of dogs over a short period of time but they're all genetically similar to one another. They're not actually very old. They're not genetically distinct, right? They just differ by a few particular mutations that make dramatic effects that we then as art have artificially selected. Uh, nature takes far, far longer to separate gene pools into separate groups of uh, variants that are adapted to particular environments, like thousands and thousands of generations. Right? There haven't been thousands and thousands of generations in the young Earth model because there's only been 4,000 years. 
you would have to get two dogs eat off the ark. They have to make enough individuals to actually segregate them into separate populations that then interbreed and are selected by those environments long enough, hundreds of years, in order to adapt them to that particular uh, environment, really probably thousands of years, but let's just say hundreds. Uh, they have to give rise to other individuals who then migrate to new uh, environments, and then they also have to adapt. And then, like, we're, we're not even talking about where all the variation come from. It's ridiculous to think that all the variation existed in just two dogs. And so the vast majority of the variation you see that makes up all these dogs are mutations. They're variants of the original genome. Ken Ham wants to make it sound like all that variation exists in the original created as perfect variation. Uh, but in fact, the vast majority of variation is almost certainly just like his variants of his, in his poodle. They are changes in the genetic information from their ancestor, which we could call mutations. Those mutations aren't necessarily bad. They create the spice of life, which is variation. Um, and many of those variations are not a negative feature for that particular organism. So this word perfect uh, makes no sense uh, in, when, you, when you start thinking about it biologically. All right, let's go back to uh, Ken Ham's stuff here. So get rid of that. Uh, let's keep going here. We're almost done. And such species were produced after flood, I guess that was after the flood, being descendants of two dogs that went on Noah's Ark and carried enormous amounts of genetic diversity in their DNA. Our domesticated, we might call purebred dogs, were produced by artificial selection. Yes. Since humans do the selecting rather than the environment and other factors, and as is the case for most of our domesticated dogs, we have selected for mutations, basically mistakes, that we like but aren't necessarily good for the dog kind. Well, I agree. My old English sheepdog has some really interesting features that we have selected for. But if I shoved her out in the woods and told her, you know, that's it. And when no more human intervention, you got to fend for yourself. She's not very fit for that environment. She just isn't. She's probably not going to survive. Right? That breed would go out of existence pretty quickly. But that's not her environment. Her environment is living with us. And we're part of her environment. We're taking care of her. Um, and she's thriving, right? Now, no, well, sheepdogs unfortunately aren't thriving great because there's not, I mean, they're a fair amount of upkeep. Uh, and that particular breed is having trouble uh, sustaining itself. But okay, okay, but back to the, back to the point. He's going to call all these mutations bad for, you know, he's calling them bad, right? Bad is only relative to the environment. If the organism survives with that particular mutation and they have more offspring, can't be considered a bad mutation. In the long run, for the species, it might not be good. Lots of different variations are good at one time and turn bad at another time. Right? I mean, if the environment changes, if it's really, you know, if the environment gets a lot colder, all right, I guess my sheepdog will be all right because she has a lot of fur. <laughs> um, Oh, oh, yeah, I, I don't want to go on and on about this point of like the relativization of bad and good alleles. The point here is just that variants are changes in genetic information as is being passed from one generation to another. And it's the environment that that organism comes into that determines whether that variant's actually helping that organism or hindering that organism going forward. Um, and I've done a bunch of other videos that, that explore this idea a lot further. So let's continue. All this means there was no degenerate mutants in the Garden of Eden. There couldn't have been poodles in the Garden of Eden. In fact, there couldn't have been foxes. There couldn't have been wolves. There couldn't have been African wild dogs. There couldn't have been any of what you see today or any of the extinct versions of dogs. None of them could have been in the Garden of Eden because they all contain mutations of the original kind. They all have, well, I'll call them, adaptations for an environment that didn't exist. See, God, you know, God, Ken Ham has this original perfect paradise, a world in which, you know, there's no death, there's no, like, the food is abund abundantly available, we didn't need to have carnivorous teeth, all that stuff, right? So all the features that they have today that are adaptions for this modern world, he might think that they're front-loaded into the original creation and God just planned for that and gave them those variations so they would suddenly pop out in those organisms later. Um, but another way of viewing it is like they're all mutations, right? The, 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 they, they're adaptions via mutation to 
new environments in the world that didn't exist in the past. But to say it that way, Muir started to sound like uh, it's starting to sound like evolutionary theory there, right? That that organisms, this is these are mechanisms for how organisms adapt and change in a changing environment, allowing them to persist and continue their existence. This also means there's no degenerate mutants in the garden. In fact, the correct definition of what we call our purebred dogs, our domesticated varieties like poodles would go something like this. Now, this is actually the reason I want to do this whole thing. I, yeah, I'm sorry. It took 40 minutes to get to this point. But, you know, this is the, his description of creation. A poodle is a sin-cursed copy of the original once very good dog that had suffered from the effects of sin and the curse to become the degenerate mutant that is today living in a fallen world. That's what a poodle is. And you can just insert whatever your favorite animal is into that. A human is a sin-cursed copy of the original once very good human that had suffered from the side effects of the curse to become the degenerate mutant that it is today in our fallen world. Another important point to make here is that, the most, that most mutations, like this concerning smallness in dogs, result from the corruption of information. These are, by and large, detrimental, the opposite of what molecules demand requires. Again, going back to that figure right there, right? Everything is sliding downhill. We're losing information. Somehow that's cor that corruption is less good than what was there before. We could point to thousands of types of mutations, though, that make things that are different than what they were before and make them better adapted to a modern environment. It's not a corruption. I don't know how you can see that as a corruption. Right? It's a change, but change is not bad in itself. It's not evil in itself. Even genetic studies of dogs confirm that what that we <laughs> try that again. Even genetic studies in dogs confirm that we'd expect from the Bible concerning created kinds and the effect of sin and the curse. Well, if that's what you're looking for, right? That's your interpretation of the curse, that it has damaged the creation, and you're interpreting the original genomes as somehow being perfect and shouldn't have changed, as if God had created those, saying, like, no change is possible. Like, you know, if Adam doesn't sin, then the world will continue with these genomes being perfectly copied and nothing would ever change. Like, you would never, there'll never be a change in the environment, so you'll never need to adapt to it. You'd never need to have new variants. Right? That's a particular reading and interpretation of scripture. That's, a, that's an interpretation of God's plan of history for the world and the universe. Perhaps the most important thing this, best, this man's best friend could ever do is tell us the truth concerning God's word. See, poodles are a witness of, of our sin. Our sin created poodles. Poodles are degenerate organisms, right? And we've created that degenerate thing. The degenerate thing lying here beneath me is a product of my sin that never would have existed, that was never intended by God in this world to have an old thing that you've done. Um, even dogs now groan because the effects of sin. And then we end it with the classic, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. It's a really tough passage. It's one that theologians have grappled over for 2,000 years. Right? This isn't something that has been recently retranslated, right? modernized. Uh, in fact, I would say that the prevailing view in the early centuries, all right, the patristic fathers, uh, was a little bit closer to something a little bit different than what we, what like young earth creationists would promote today in terms of 822 referring, specifically referring to the, um, the curse placed on creation, right? I'm just going to read the abstract from an article from Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith uh, from just 2021, uh, William Horst. I uh, wrote, wrote an article analysis of this particular section of scripture, and I'm just going to read the abstract of the article to give you a flavor for um, what is a relatively common um, understanding of this verse, despite what Ken Ham always leads his audience to believe, which is like, this is just obvious. Like, everybody believes that this is what the groaning of creation refers to. Uh, in Romans, Paul describes creation's groaning in anticipation of eschatological freedom 
from present slavery to corruption, right? If you look at Romans 8, like 19 through 22, and think about that in the context of, of Paul's other works, scholars commonly interpret creation's slavery to corruption as an allusion to the curse God pronounces on the ground in response to the transgression of Adam and Eve, Genesis 3, 17 through 19 which Paul understands as reflective of the corruption of creation by the introduction of physical death and decomposition. That's clearly what Ken Ham is referring to here, right? Adam sinned and all of a sudden there's death, there's corruption, there's decay. And so therefore there was perfection. And then everything after that is a degenerate uh, from, that perfect, from that perfect state. This article argues that the slavery to corruption view, which is what that view could be called, is better understood in reference to human moral corruption of the sort. Is better understood in reference to human moral corruption of the sort Paul describes in the preceding chapters, Romans 6 through 8. So there's context for what is said in 8.22. Under this interpretation, the groaning of creation is reminiscent of a number of biblical prophetic texts in which the earth is said to mourn over the detrimental effects of human sin. Right? God's creation, which is part of God's in, entire plan, nothing's happened you know, outside of his plan, um, recognizes that the expectation that Adam would fulfill his obligation, but the rest of creation is mourning the fact that Adam is not fulfilling his obligations and duties as co-regents and uh, creators on this earth and organizing this earth, right? So the chaos, the, um, the disorder still continues in which the world God had planned to have put into greater order. And so the creation is groaning as a result of that, not groaning because it was perfect and now has gone into a state of imperfection is waiting to come back to perfection, but because it was as it was, and it was supposed to get better over time. Man was supposed to hearken in a a better, more fuller creation, which didn't happen. Um, yeah, and this is just something that I'm going to explore uh, a lot further uh, as I begin to look at a couple things, which would be uh, one of which is and this is just some. That's just a tiny snapshot of of a fairly common interpretation of sort of the whole context of the Bible, and that kind of fits with my overall biblical theology um, sort of viewpoint of the unfolding of history. Uh, and so I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about this uh, when I do a pretty thorough book review of this book right here, God's Good Earth, The Case for an Unfallen Creation. And unfallen would mean that, uh, when it's speaking sp specifically of the physical world, um, and that's uh, John Garvey's book. And so I've done a tremendous amount of highlighting so far that I plan to put that together in terms of like a uh, kind of like take you through this book. And I'm going to I'm going to use it. I'm going to do so by using quotes and we'll look at this idea of just how bad right is the earth? How much is the world corrupted by uh, Adam's sin? And then there's other books that kind of go along with that. I'm not you know, always in sync with some of these, but like Peril in Paradise is a pretty interesting read. Uh, and it gives a one particular perspective on why there is death and why, you know, how there could be death before uh, sin for um, other animals and, you know, basically why the world is in bondage to decay from the beginning of time and how that isn't the eschatological goal. Um, and so, it's a it's a viewpoint of the unfolding and progress of God's creation through time. Uh, so, right, I'm going to leave it there, though. Uh, this has been plenty of time for today. I'm running up close to an hour, and I want to try to keep uh, some of these things uh, well underneath an hour, which I was unable to do this time. I'll try to edit it down a little bit. Anyway, thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, this has been fun. We're going to... I'm, I've got This Week in Creationism coming up. I've got uh, three or four other reactions that I have to other posts that I've seen recently. Uh, I want to do a five big scientific problems with the arc in the darkness of film that I saw recently. Sort of like an expose on five things that I think they got completely wrong. 
Uh, and I'm also going to do what I, what I got a fun series that I've been starting to work on, but I don't know how long it's going to take me to do, but it's going to be like five um, evidences of an ancient earth that you've probably never heard of before, right? I don't want to use like the classic like um, arguments for why the earth is old. I'm going to come up with five things that most of you, unless you're like extreme followers of mine in terms of like my blog from, from years ago, um, may have never heard of, all right? So five new arguments. Uh, and I'll probably do like five arguments from geology. And I might do five arguments from astronomy. All right? And then five biological arguments. Um, and try to come up with five sort of, for each one of those, very novel, sort of unique uh, angles and approaches to uh, the question of the age of the Earth. All right, so those are some things I'm thinking about. And uh, that's it. Thanks for hanging out with me here uh, in my home. And yeah, my dogs are still asleep, so sorry. No uh, dog interruptions, other than that one that I'm going to edit out. So you're not going to see that one, sorry. All right, talk to you later. Bye-bye.